Okay, thanks for the introduction. Uh, yeah, I'll say a couple more words about more the scientific aspects. Um, I am a statistician, uh, but I'm very, very much on the applied side. Uh, and I have mostly, I mean, I pretty much have always worked with biology, um, biological applications, but mainly in two very different fields. Uh, the most recent thing I've done is to work in bioinformatics. Uh, and in that field, I mainly develop um, statistical tools, so statistical methods that are then released as R packages, basically, uh, for several omics data sets. And so in this case, we I don't really have a particular data set that I care about, that I want to analyze, but I try to develop a, a general tool, uh, a general method that then others can uh, can use in their, in their analysis. Uh, and before that, and I did that, at the University of Zurich, where uh, where I was a postdoc, and uh, um, I still work in this field now in uh, in Bologna. Before that, I um, I did my PhD in England, where I, where I worked in systems biology. In that case, I had pretty much the opposite scenario. So I analyzed a specific data set, which was actually very complex to analyze, and so we developed kind of an ad, ad hoc uh, methodology for that. Now, this introduction is useful because I'll be talking about this, this field. So I'm going to give you um, a couple of, uh, I'll, I'll be speaking about a couple of projects from the bioinformatics side and one or two projects from the uh, systems biology side. Now, generally, um, I mostly am a Bayesian, so I mostly use Bayesian statistics uh, for two main reasons. Because I work with biological data and biological data is characterized by a lot of missing data. So the you know, biology is already complex. And so there's a lot of noise on the biological side, but the measurements we have are inaccurate. They're noisy. Uh, we, we never, you know, we wish to observe like mRNA or protein um, abundances like populations, but we never really do. There is always noise. And that introduces typically latent states or missing data for the actual uh, elements we're trying to observe. Um, and with frequented statistics, it's very hard to actually work properly with missing data and propagate the uncertainty missing data forward. In Bayesian statistics, I mean, that's a lot more intuitive because every missing point is just a parameter. And so you treat it just like any other parameter, you just sample it. So it, it gives a very natural framework to deal with latent variables. And the second reason is that in biology, you often have additional information about your data, your parameters that could come, for instance, from other studies uh, you know, maybe there was someone else five years ago who did some analysis and found the uh, degradation or synthesis rates of your, uh, you know, the organism you're studying, or the information could also come from other genes. Sometimes in mathematics, you, you know, often you, you study multiple genes, and although each gene behaves differently, you know, the other genes still can tell you something about the specific gene uh, you're, you're studying. And so that, again, can be embedded in a very natural way uh, as prior information. So uh, Bayesian statistics gives you a very elegant and um, formal way to deal with these two uh, with these two issues. So as I said, I'm going to give you um, an overview of a couple of projects in bioinformatics and then one or two, depending on time, in systems biology. Um, I'll stop in the middle so that, because topics are actually very different, so you can ask questions about you know, the first part and then the second part. Okay, I'll start with bandits. Bandits is the first project I've done in, in bioinformatics and it deals with uh, bulk RNA-seq data. So I assume most of you know what RNA-seq data is, but I'll give a very, very short introduction. Um, in bulk RNA-seq data, you observe a signal that represents an average of many cells. So you cannot distinguish the um, what comes from each individual cell, but on the contrary, you can study quite decently transcript, um, transcript level signals. So you can disentangle what transcript of a gene signal is coming from. Then on the other hand, for instance, you have single cell RNA-seq data where you pretty much have the opposite. So you, you can separate the single cells, but then it becomes harder to disentangle the transcript signal, uh, you know, the signal that comes from the transcripts from the same gene. And then obviously you also have spatial transcriptomics and other things. But let's focus on bulk uh, RNA-seq data here. So very, very schematically and briefly, what kind of data do we have? Well, we typically have these RNA-seq fragments, which are basically sequences of amino acids, which are reverse transcribed from the mRNAs. Now, the thing is that those originally were coming from some 
a specific mRNA or a specific transcript, but we don't observe that tag, that label. You know, they don't say I'm coming from transcript A, transcript B. You just observe the sequence. So what you have to do is to align them to a reference. So we typically have a reference genome or transcriptome. And so we just check what are the locations of our reference that those sequences, those reads are compatible with. And then we put them there. And after we've done this, and as you will see later, this is a very noisy process. This is not exact. This is, a, uh, this is typically uh, an imperfect allocation. And after you do that, then you can just count. OK, how many reads are compatible with this gray gene, 13? How many reads are compatible with this uh, red gene, 7? And then you get a count table, and then you can do your inference with that. Um, as you will see in some of the methods, which in this, with this method, with, with bandits, we try to account or the uncertainty here, and so avoid these actually uh, count metrics. But this is the classical and most general scenario. OK, so let's get a little bit more into what the package actually does. We work with alternative splicing. So um, I am very, I'm a statistician, so I'm very, very ignorant in biology. I'll, I'll try not to uh, embarrass myself and say very general things. Uh, you know, in transcription, the, uh, like a molecule of our RNA is transcribed from, gene, from DNA. And originally, this RNA has both exons and introns. So this is also called unspliced or immature RNA. And then after splicing, the exons are put together and the introns, the introns are removed or spliced out. And you're left with a molecule of mature or spliced mRNA. And this then will translate into a protein. Now, with alternative splicing, a single gene can actually lead to multiple uh, mRNAs or multiple transcripts that can code um, uh, to several proteins. And therefore, this is a, a very useful uh, process. But obviously, it can be disrupted in disease or it can be altered by tr drug treatment. And so sometimes it's useful to study how this alternative splicing process changes between conditions. Again, healthy disease, treated and treated, or treatment A versus treatment B. And so what we what Bandits does is exactly this. It tries to look for um, it tries to look for the genes that display a change in this kind of alternative splicing patterns. Now, when we talk about changes in alternative splicing patterns, we have to define what we mean. And in practice, we mean the relative abundance of the transcripts. So if you have a gene that codes like here, for three transcripts, you can think that in one condition, you're expressing 70% of the times transcript A, 30% transcript B, and never express transcript C. While in another condition, you can express maybe 50% of the time A, 20% B, and 30% C. So we look at the relative abundances um, of, the, of the transcripts within a gene. Now, you might have heard of, I don't know what, what, what's your background, but you you might have heard of differential gene expression. That is a different thing, because in that case, we look at the overall abundance at the gene level. So we don't really care what transcript the mRNA is coming from, the reads are coming from. We only care at the overall abundance at the gene level. So we aggregate all of them together. So this is a different kind of analysis. Now let's get more into the mathematics, or conceptually at least. Now, in order to do this, uh, what we would love to have is just how many RNA seq reads are mapping to each one of the or are coming from each one of these transcripts. But we don't know that because, as I said before, the alignment step is actually noisy. So we don't always know how many uh, reads uh, are coming from a particular transcript. And that complicates our inference because, in practice, we have what's called multi mapping reads. So let's take this very simple very simple uh, gene with two transcripts, blue and red. And these are supposed to be kind of represent uh, RNA seq reads. Now you see that in some cases there is a unique alignment because you know that this read is coming from the blue transcript because there's only there's only the blue transcript in this location. These these two reads are coming from the red transcript, but these seven reads are compatible with both. So in reality, they're coming either from the red or the blue transcript, but you don't know that. So of course, there are tools like Summon or Callisto that use something like a, an expectation maximization algorithm 
and uh, estimate the total abundance of the red and the blue transcript. Uh, but as I was saying before, this is an estimate. So there is uncertainty in, the, in these estimates. Uh, and so you have to propagate this uncertainty forward if you want to have a, an accurate uh, inference for, for your method. So instead of using these estimates, we use what, what I said before, a latent variable approach. So we work with what's called equivalence classes. So we just count how many reads map to what transcripts. So you would have one read mapping to the blue transcript only, then two reads here mapping to the red one, and then seven ambiguous reads that map to both blue and red. Now, as I said, the seven reads have an actual allocation, blue or red, but we don't know it. So for us, this is missing data. The allocation of those reads is unknown, and we just treat it as a latent variable. So this allocation is a parameter that we sample within our model. Now, obviously, we don't sample it once. We sample it iteratively within the model so that you know, every, every iteration of the model has a different allocation of the seven reads, and that propagates the uncertainty in these allocations. Now, for a moment, assume that you've done the allocation, so you know what um, you know what transcript each read maps to. Um, so you know that you have a gene which has k transcripts, and you have several biological replicates. So we have like three or five healthy samples, for instance. Now you think you think that in this gene, the reads that you have observed are distributed across the k transcripts according to a multinomial. So that's a classical assumption. You just have a multinomial allocation. And this multinomial has a parameter pi that just tells you the relative abundance of the transcripts, like, like I said before, 20%, 15%, Now, we use a, what's called a hierarchical model, uh, which is exactly the same, or conceptually the same, as a mixed effect model, because we assume that every sample has its own uh, parameter vector pi. We don't assume that every sample has the same relative abundance of transcripts. Uh, that, that can vary. And so each sample has a different parameter. But at the same time, it, would be, uh, it wouldn't be very clever to analyze each sample independently. And so we have a common prior that is this relay here, where, parameter, where samples have their own parameters, but they also share information between each other. And so this is a classical Bayesian hierarchical model. It's, it, it's not that fancy. I mean, I, I think I made it more complicated when I explained it now. Now, this is useful because not only it allows for sharing of information, but also it gives us parameters at the group level. Because if we want to study healthy versus disease, we don't care so much about the individual people in the healthy group or the individual mice, whatever we're studying. We care about kind of an average at the group level of healthy people and an average of the disease people. And so these parameters here are called hyperparameters, and they represent the group level description. And so that, in, that can be re, re parameterized as the group level average relative abundance, and this precision parameter that indicates how this group level average changes from sample to sample, basically how much variability between, there is between the samples of the group. Um, and so I described, I said at the beginning, there are two main reasons for me to, uh, to be a Bayesian, you know, latent variables and um, prior information. So I described here how we use uh, a latent variable approach. And here we get to the second point, which is sharing of information with, with, um, with an informative prior. So I anticipated a little bit things before because I said, we analyze multiple genes. So this is this kind of analysis done for you know, 10, 20,000 genes. Um, and so each gene is obviously has its own you know, number of transcripts, uh, different parameters. So we cannot assume obviously the same parameters for the genes. But there is, there is something that we can think of as being similar, not the same, but similar between genes. And that is this dispersion parameter here or precision parameter that again indicates the, the variability between samples. And so what we do, um, with bandits is to get an, an initial estimate of those parameters. And then uh, we use it to formulate an empirical, uh, um, an informative prior. So I heard that before empirical base was, or was already mentioned. So that's, that's the same thing. Uh, we also use an empirical base approach. That basically means that we use the data twice. It's a bit of a trick 
because you use the data to get this initial estimate and then you reuse it to analyze. So it can be risky. It can be risky empirical based because you're using the data twice. But in this case, uh, it's a very, very mild empirical base. Um, and this is because this prior formulation here comes from thousands of genes. So each individual gene contributes to the prior, but in a very, very, very marginal um, uh, form. And so uh, it, we're almost not re reusing the data twice. Um, and then we get to the overall, let's see, this leads us to the overall sets of parameters that we want to sample. So as I said, we have this basically latent variables there, the hierarchical, you know, sample specific parameters, the hyper parameters, the group level, we want to sample them because there is no uh, analytic formulation that just gives us the, you know, the, the, the posterior distribution of, of the object of interest. Now, as you can think, you know, sampling, uh, all these parameters cannot be done at once. Just it's not realistic because we're talking about many, many parameters. And so we sample them um, in blocks. So we use what's called metropolis within Gibbs. That is a fancy name that basically means that we're just doing little bits at a time and not all of the things together, which is very you know, intuitive and I think reasonable. And so we build, we know the conditional distribution of these parameters. And so we just sample from it. Now, uh, the issue with this kind of method, obviously, is that uh, you have to check that, you know, first of all, computationally, uh, it can be intensive. And then you have to check that things are converging. Um, but thankfully, most of our steps, I don't know if you've done that before. I, um, I did not attend the previous two days, so I'm not sure. Um, I don't know if you have seen the discrete difference between Gibbs and Metropolis Sampler. But if you have, assuming you have, uh, most of these steps follow a Gibbs sampler, which means that you directly target your distribution of interest. And so that is quite efficient in terms of convergence, of mixing, and only a handful of parameters, so the hyperparameters, which are very, very few, uh, K only in particular, while well, these are dozens, only those K parameters follow a metropolis sampler, which is um, a, bit, a bit nastier and, and slower. Um, but obviously, additionally to that, we want to ensure convergence. And I don't know if you've done that or also, um, but probably the best way, I think in my opinion, the best way to assess convergence of, of Bayesian statistics is to, um, sorry, not, not Bayesian statistics, of, of uh, posterior chains, MCMC posterior chains. The best way is to actually look at the chains uh, because that works much better than using uh, uh, any, any test that you can find around. But when you analyze, thousands of genes, and also you release a tool for users, you cannot have users check who don't know business statistics. Uh, you cannot ask them to check thousands and thousands of chains. That is uh, absolutely unfeasible. And so in practice, we have to use a convergence test, which is absolutely not ideal, but it's better than nothing. At least it guarantees some sort of uh, uh, stability in the results. Um, and then, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure you, you have spoken about, you've talked about that. MCMC can be very computational intensive because you have to sample a lot of parameters. And you do that, this kind of loop there, you do that at every iteration for, I mean, it depends on the, on the program, but you know, thousands of iterations typically. So that can take a long time. Um, particularly if you code in R, so these are more practical things, but you know, if you're familiar with R, when you do nested loops, that takes a very, very long time. It's not efficient to do nested loops in R. And MCMC is all about nested loops because you have iterative um, uh, processes. And so we have coded this in C++ and we managed to, um, to, get, it, uh, to get it going uh, in, a, in a much smaller time than, than we originally had in, in R. And so overall, it takes like less than one second per gene. So that means like one or two hours. For, uh, for a full data set on a laptop. Um, so statistically, we do a test for every gene, for every transcript. Uh, we have thousands of them, so we want to correct for it. Uh, and so we do that uh, by, uh, you know, Benjamini Hodgeberg correction, so that ensures that FDR is uh, calibrated. I won't talk about that, I'll, I'll spare you this one. Uh, but just keep in mind that we do account for the length of transcripts. So just intuitively, some transcripts are longer, some are shorter. The abundance 
two equally abundant transcripts, uh, you know, take two equally abundant transcripts. If one is longer, you will see more reads in that one because there's more places that where reads are coming from. And so we account for that. We normalize by the length of the transcripts. So, okay, so far I've shown how you can do your inference in the healthy group, in the disease group, you know, group A, group B, whatever you want to call them. But I said the method was to actually do identify genes that differ between groups. So now what we want to do is to actually compare groups. Now, what basic statistics is not very good at is to uh, to do tests uh, because you know it's you cannot you don't you don't get a p value with Bayesian statistics. You can do base factors, and it's not the same. The interpretation is 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 rough. Um, it's it's definitely not as elegant as a as a frequentist statistical test that gives you a p value, uh, an FDR test, and so on. So what we did here was a bit of a trick because we we go back to the frequentist world. So we actually approximate our posterior chains and use a frequentist test. So let me show you what we did. It's quite intuitive. You know, if, you, if you're starting two groups, A and B, you have this kind of, you know, group level relative abundances. So we compare these guys in the group A and group B. Now, we just take their difference. If the alternative splicing patterns are the same, then those guys are expected to do the same. And so the difference is zero. And that's our null hypothesis. Well, if there, is alter there are differences in alternative splicing, then some of those guys will be different. And so some of those differences will not be zero. And so we have our alternative. So we can approximate the posterior of these differences by a multivariate normal. But these you know, mean and variance are just covariance metrics. It's not just the variance. These are just estimated from the posterior chains. If you do that, then it's very easy to use a multivariate world test and use the frequency statistics. And that also allows us to do testing for each individual transcript. Same thing, but we have a univariate world test. Now, after developing that, we obviously had to test it. And so we ran several benchmarks. I'll just give you the key idea here. Uh, we try to simulate data, which is as realistic as possible. So how do we do that? Well, we, we take, we start from a real data set and we infer the parameters. Then we use those parameters to generate a new data set. And we do that by simulating actually at the read level. So going back to our scheme, we simulate these reads. Okay, we don't simulate a count table because obviously that would neglect the uncertainty that comes here in the alignment. So we simulate actual reads that then have to be aligned and so on. And so we actually have the, the uncertainty in that alignment step in our simulation. Uh, and then we simulate two groups where you know, we artificially obviously introduce a difference between the groups in the alternative splicing. And we have several competitors. Now, the key point mathematically is that the two things that we do, mapping uncertainty and sample to sample variability, none of the other competitors has both of them. And we, this is actually what motivated us to develop the method. And I won't go too much into detail here because I don't think it's very interesting, but I have to at least acknowledge and mention this. This is a true positive versus FDR plot. It's a bit like a rock curve, but with the FDR instead of the false positives. So you want to be on the top left corner. You want high true positive and low false discovery rates. Um, and so we have bandits in green and then several competitors. And you see that we're here, so we're doing quite well in terms of uh, true positive rate, so statistical power, but also uh, false discoveries. And this is for the gene level test, and we have pretty much a similar pattern for the transcript level test. And then additionally, we also used a real data set where we have um, some genes that were validated in the lab. Now, uh, let me say a general thing. Simulations are good because you have a perfect ground truth. You, you simulate it from it, so you know the ground truth. but Although you try to make them realistic, they're never as realistic as real data. So real data, on the other hand, is perfectly realistic because it's real data, but you never have a perfect validation set. And so we try to do both things and, and get an overall picture. So here we have a validation set of 82 genes. Um, and that allows us to build some something like a noisy rock curve. 
uh, where again, um, you have bandits there in green. So again, it, it shows that also in real data, we had a uh, pretty good performance. Uh, computationally, we obviously take longer than simpler methods, um, but still we're in the range of like uh, one or two hours of, on, for a full analysis on a, on a laptop because of the, um, you know, the computational aspect I said before. No, no, I, I'll spare you the summary. I just say that the package is in back conductor. And um, yeah, I mean, if you want more details, there is the paper. If there are no questions, I'll, I'll tell you the second project in mathematics, and then maybe I'll stop a bit to kind of cover this, this part. Okay. Okay, completely different project. This is about proteomics, and in particular about protogenomics, because we actually try to integrate transcriptomics and proteomics. So forget everything we spoke about before, because this is a very different uh, application. Now, bottom-up proteomics is the main way to get uh, to study proteins, but the issue, technical challenge, is that you wish to infer proteins, but you don't. You study peptides. And now peptides have the issue that most peptides actually are coming or are associated to multiple proteins. And you don't really know which one, you know, the, what, what protein the signal is coming from. And then also peptides occasionally are erroneously detected. Uh, you do have a probability of, of their error, uh, but obviously this makes our inference even more complicated. Now, if you think about this, this is very similar to the mapping issue I mentioned before with RNA-seq data, because we had reads that map to multiple transcripts. Here we have peptides that map to multiple proteins. So why not use those methods? Because things are messier in proteomics. So you have a lot less information, way fewer peptides. There's a lot more technical noise. And so while in transcriptomics, we can get good estimates of the transcripts, even just by using Salmon or Callisto, in proteomics, that is very, very challenging. Uh, and so normally you have two options. Either you use some methods that are not very accurate at the isoform level, or you do inference at the gene level. Uh, but then obviously you lose resolution. You don't actually know what, what are the individual isoforms that are, um, that are involved in you know, whatever process you're studying. So with this project, what we try to build is a, uh, uh, is a model for that actually does inference at the isoform level. And the key idea, or one of the key ideas, is that we try to enhance the data that we have by using trusted atomics data. So obviously, you know, transcripts are correlated to proteins because they're a prerequisite of proteins. And so we can use additional information and try to do a better job at uh, studying proteins at the isoform level. And mainly, so getting a bit more into the detail, what we want to do is to study if a protein is in isoform is present in the database, estimate their abundance if they're highly lowly abundant, and then also study what are the isoforms where the transcript and protein abundances are very different. You know, those, those that maybe have a low transcript abundance, but they're really abundant at the protein level, or vice versa, highly abundant at the transcript level and lowly abundant at the protein level. So something is going on between the two processes. Um, and obviously we associate, because I'm a statistician, we associate a measure of uncertainty to this. So we, we don't just say if, a, if an isoform is present absence, we have a posterior probability of presence. And with respect to the abundance, we also have a, a credible interval, so a, an, an interval estimate. Uh, just to give you an example application, although I think it's, it's quite intuitive, uh, you know, there's, there's this MIT, MIT transcription factor, which is a gene. Uh, which we know is differentially abundant between subtypes of melanoma. But we don't know what are the isoforms that are differentially abundant. And so with this kind of approach, uh, you could think of studying the individual isoforms that are abundant in each subtype of melanoma and then comparing uh, subtypes, melanoma subtypes. So the nice thing from my side, the nice thing about this project is that um, I think for the first time in bioinformatics, I was actually really supported by a, by a lab, by a biological lab, uh, which is in the States. And they're really helping us, you know, motivating the study, 
providing us uh, the data for the validation and also kind of guiding us in the in the right direction, not just what is kind of statistically pleasant, but also what is biologically useful. So now I'll get a little bit into the mathematics, but I'll, I'll try to keep it um, at the high level. So I'll try to assist, I'll try only to, to talk about the concept. So what kind of data do we have? Well, we do have, so say you have peptides. As I said, we observe peptides. So you can think of observing the abundance of peptides. And then each peptide is associated to one or multiple proteins. So you're going to have, say, this vector there that basically tells you all the proteins that are associated to the peptide, basically just a map. And then I said that peptides can be erroneously detected, but we do have an estimate of the probability they're, they're, that they're erroneously detected. And so we have that estimate there. And then if you collect RNA-seq data, we also have um, the information about the abundance of the isoforms on the transcript side. And we take that as prior information. So what we would like to have, basically we have information about peptides and transcripts. What we want to have is information about proteins. And so we want the overall abundance and the relative abundance of the protein isoforms. So how do we get there? Well, for a moment, assume that you actually have the abundance, the overall protein abundance. Uh, that, so you don't have missing data, you don't have these latent variables. Well, then it's very easy. You can distribute the abundance again with a multinomial. You have n isoforms. You just allocate the abundance to your isoforms following a multinomial. Uh, and then your relative abundance parameter has a prior that, that, that basically depends on the transcript relative abundance. So the transcript relative abundance is used to formulate a prior for the protein isoform relative abundance. Uh, this is not a hierarchical model. Uh, it looks the same as before, but there is no I there. It's just, it's just analyzing individual samples here. So this is a simpler. Uh, but as I said, these Ys are not observed. These are the protein abundances. We don't see them uh, because we see information at the peptide level. And so we, again, this is mixing data and we recover the uh, information at the isoform protein level with a latent variable approach. And here we have a, a double latent variable approach because as I said here, peptides could be erroneously detected and they map to multiple proteins. And so we sample, first of all, if a peptide has been correctly detected and then only for peptides which have been correctly detected, we go to, set to the second step. And so we allocate their abundance to the proteins of origin. And that's how we do it mathematically. So it's actually a fairly simple model because it's, again, it's a Bernoulli, multinomial. There's nothing really fancy here. Um, so peptide, correctly or incorrectly identified, that, that, just, that is just a sampling from a Bernoulli, depending on the error probability. And then only for peptides that were estimated to be present, we allocate their abundance. So again, a multinomial. But obviously, this multinomial does not depend on all the pi parameters there. It depends on a subset of those, and in particular, only on the proteins that each isoform, each um, peptide is compatible with. Right? Intuitively, if a peptide is compatible with proteins A and B, you know, it, you're going to allocate it to proteins A and B. That's all. And obviously, you know, th this is the key idea. But in the MCMC, we do this iteratively. So there are you know, not many steps, I think a uh, few thousands of steps. And at each iteration, you do, this, uh, you do these steps. Now, for the validation, we use a different strategy here compared to, um, to bandits. Um, because simulations in proteomics are not as, uh, not as good, not as accurate as they are in transcriptomics. And so we actually use real data. Um, and so, Again, the nice thing uh, of having collaborators is that they collected uh, very accurate real data for us. So they had uh, what's called the multi protein data set, where basically they analyzed the same thing. So, so don't ask me to be too technical, but they analyzed the same thing in my, in my view for, with using six distinct proteases. Now, what we can do then is something like a cross-validation approach, where we basically analyze one protease, 
and then we use the other, the other five to build the ground truth. And so we check the results of the Proteus we analyzed with the other five, and then we rotate. So we analyze one Proteus at a time and use the remaining five, and we do that for all six Proteases. Now, as I said before, real data means that the ground truth is noisy. Uh, it's not perfect, but it's accurate enough. So how do we build the ground truth here? Well, we use a subset of the data, and in particular, we only use the peptides uh, we are very confident about. So we only use the peptides that have a very, very low probability of being um, wrong, and that are associated to an individual protein. Um, and then we test our model with a couple of, um, with two frameworks using the mRNA abundances, but also without them, because Although I've shown that you know, we use mRNA abundances, in principle, the model can also run without them. And you use a, a vaguely informative prior there. Uh, but obviously, the rationale is that if you have them, then hopeful, hopefully results are more accurate. And uh, we have a few competitors. But as I said, there are very few that do this kind of inference. So in the end, we're, we have only three competitors. And so we tried to validate uh, two pieces of inference here the presence absence of the individual isoforms, but also the abundance of the isoforms. And so for the presence absence, it's quite intuitive that we have a rock curve uh, where, again, you have basically sensitivity and one minus specificity, so true positive versus false positive rates. Again, you want to be you know, as high as possible with your curve. Uh, well, the diagonal indicates pretty much randomness, so a toss of a coin. And you see that these three lines there, they represent our competitors. And these two lines represent our method. So in red here, you have the method without the mRNA abundances, which is fair because it uses the same information as the other methods. And you see the result, the result get really gain. And then when we add the mRNA abundances, we get more accurate inference, which is exactly what we were, what we were hoping for. Uh, and we also validate the, um, as I said, the the actual abundance that we estimate, um, and we do that by simply looking at the you know uh, mRNA abundances that we estimate versus our noisy ground truth, and we get actually a very good agreement in terms of log temp um, to correlation of 0.72, which in my view is particularly good because uh, again keep in mind that here you have noise on both sides, so obviously there is noise in our estimates and that's always the case, but there is also noise in the ground truth. So this ground truth is noisy, it's not perfect. So there is, I think there is a pretty good agreement keeping that in mind. Now, this project is not complete. Uh, it's actually nowhere in publicly, uh, but we're, we're writing the package uh, and I think we'll have the package and the preprint in summer, hopefully July, if we don't delay it. Um, but then this is to me like one step in, in a series of uh, potential analysis in the field where you can think of extending this model and doing other things in proteogenomics, uh, the most natural extensions that I have in mind are to uh, just consider multiple samples. So this model uses one sample, but as you've seen in bandits, you can use multiple samples, it uses our hierarchical model. And that has two advantages. One is that you have more, actually multiple advantages. You have more information because samples share information between each other. You have a group level, um, result, so like an average for the group A, an average for group B, and then you can do differential testing, but at the isoform level. So that allows us to, to go one step forward and also do differential testing at the isoform level between groups. And similarly, we can explore single cell applications, where in that case, you can think of doing, again, inference at the isoform level, but on cell type, so cell type specific inference. And importantly, I do have a um, I do have funding for a one year postdoc position um, in Bologna. So that is actually to continue this project. So that is to develop methods and continue these basic methods in proteogenomics. It's in the Department of Statistics, so there is a requirement of having a PhD in statistics or a similar field like mathematics but statistics. Uh, we should have the application out in July. And then the start date has to be within the year. So probably uh, sometime between September and December. Uh, I have to say, apart from the project, 
Uh, Bologna is a wonderful city. Not, not, not maybe the best city to, to visit in Italy, but it's a really wonderful city to live in. So if you're interested, uh, drop, me, drop me an email and uh, I'll, I'll give you more details. Um, I'm going to stop here, take all your questions, and then only with the time left, I'll, I'll cover the second part because I think it's, uh, uh, it's less interesting, it's re less relevant, at least for me. Okay, thank you, Simone. Hey. So I guess that uh, now if everyone has any questions. Or remarks. Okay, okay. We, we've given we've given them enough time. Okay, I'll move ahead, and uh, and then and then you have a second shot uh, at the end. So Is there a chat? always write in the write in the chat. Oh, uh, I guess you mean that the the dynamics package. Uh, no, it's not. It's not out. Uh, we we are writing it. It's it's almost complete. We're kind of refining it. So, I mean, realistically, I think the package could be out in June and then the paper, I mean, that takes a bit more time because we have collaborators, but yeah, July, August, maybe. So, but I think the package will come first. So uh, I think next month it should be out. I'll, I'll put it on Twitter. Okay, then changing completely topic. Uh, let me show you a couple of applications of uh, Bayesian inference in systems biology. Uh, so as I said before, in bioinformatics, I worked on developing actual methods, so tools uh, without a particular data set at hand. Here I did the opposite in, in systems biology. So I actually, you will see there are actually two actual data analysis where we develop an ad hoc methodology for them. Uh, okay, questions are coming. Uh, do the common peptides contribute equally? Okay, I think, okay, I'm, I'm asked if, I don't know if you can see the question, if the common peptide intensities contribute equally to the groups uh, peptide maps to. Uh, so basically like if you have a peptide here that maps to four proteins, if, it, if it's, I guess uh, the question, if, it, if it's allocated equally to them, uh, it's not. The peptides are associated, or you know, the, the information about peptides is allocated to the proteins they map to, but not equally. That that would be a very, you know, inaccurate model. Mm -hmm. So let's take this peptide here that maps to isoforms D and E. Now, the allocation of the information is done proportionally to the relative abundances of the proteins. Okay, so there is a probabilistic model behind. So you have. Basically, here the relative abundances of the proteins they determine how you allocate the information about the peptides. So, if one of the isoforms is a lot stronger, let's say, so it has a lot more information than the other one, then these the information of this peptide is going to be allocated mainly to that one. And it's pretty much the same in bandits. Okay, so exactly the same story when we allocate. Um, when we associate reads to the isoforms of origin, to the transcripts of origin. Okay, happy to take more if, if they can. Okay, so let me talk now about this project where we, we're studying, um, again, this particular uh, transcription factor in RF2, uh, which is somehow relevant because it, it plays a key role in kind of uh, regulating the expression of some important some important genes. I won't, I won't go too much in the biology, 
but it's an important gene that regulates others. And so it's quite useful to study it. So in order to do that, we collected uh, several measurements. In this case, we have uh, light intensity measurements. So this is fluorescent data. Uh, means that basically you, you introduce a fluorescent in, in the cell. I'll, I'll tell you about the details later. And then you stimulate it with a laser and that produces light. Now the light is proportional to the uh, protein abundance. So if there is more light, then there is more protein. If there is less light, there is less protein. But obviously, it's not a, if there is not a one-to-one -one match. You don't have the actual population. Uh, you only have a, something that is proportional to it. So you do this thing. If you have, then you get these images, and then semi-manually, you have to draw the borders of the nucleus and of the cytoplasm. And if you do that, then you can compute the average intensity in the nucleus and in the cytoplasm. And so you basically summarize this image with two points. Now, if you do that every two minutes for several hours, we will get to a bivariate time series. So where you get the intensities in the nucleus and in the cytoplasm, and you see that they are partially independent, but also partially correlated. Like here, there is a drop in the nucleus and there is an increase in the cytoplasm, which is intuitive because here there is a large amount of, of NRF2, which is moving from the nucleus into the cytoplasm. And the interesting thing of uh, the interest of the project was to try and study these movements and in particular the, these translocations to understand more about the system. Now we had a, an original idea of how the system was, was working, which by the way, that's, that's why it's called systems biology because you have these kinds of systems that explain how uh, kind of a process is, is working. But that actually was very complicated and too hard to work with because we didn't have all the data we needed. You know, this involves several actors, as you see, but we only had this NRF2 there. And so we had to simplify this system, which is more accurate, but impossible to fit. We had to simplify it to something like that, where you have five possible events. So this kind of summarizes the key things that can happen. You can, of course, have a, new, a synthesis of a new molecule that uh, you know, our biologists told us that it's supposed to happen in the cytoplasm. Then you have a degradation that can happen in the cytoplasm, but it can also happen in the nucleus. And then, as I said before, things can move from the nucleus into the cytoplasm or vice versa, from the, sorry, from the cytoplasm into the nucleus or vice versa, from the nucleus into the cytoplasm. So you have five possible events. And mathematically, you can associate based on obviously some biological rational a, a hazard to these events that represents if you like their probability of happening in a short time interval in particular we think that there is for instance a constant synthesis that the degradation is linear so it's proportional to how much uh, protein you have that the input is linear well the expert is actually more complicated because it's non-linear and it also depends on a delay. So it depends on the amount of protein that you had in the past. And that is because there is a process here that is happening. And so you know that there is a delay, delayed quantity here that plays a role. So anyway, these are kind of parameters that are defined together with the biologists. Uh, but the key point is that this allows you to then formulate a model and in particular, this is what's called a Markov jump process, uh, where you have several reactions, you know, the five reactions there. And these hazards tell you how likely they are to happen in a, in a small time interval. Now, I think I'll skip this because it's probably not relevant for this audience, but that allows you with further approximations to get to a normal likelihood, okay? So you get to a normal likelihood where you basically consider the difference from a time point to the next time point. Okay, so every time, you know, every two minutes you have a movement. So every two minutes you recompute these hazards and you check what happened next. So where did this time series go? Now, one of the key things is that this model is stochastic. This, um, this is basically uh, a stochastic differential equation. Uh, and it's actually quite challenging to work with stochastic models because it's very hard to infer them, the, the parameters. So why didn't we work with a deterministic one? Because deterministic models are actually good models when you work with an average signal. So if you have a large population of cells, 
and you want to study the overall signal of this NR2 protein on average across many cells, then all the models work very well. But single cell data are very noisy. And so deterministic models are not, uh, are not accurate. Okay, here's uh, so far I described a bit the complexity on the biological side, uh, but then we also have the complexity on the measurement side. So originally, you know, you have DNA that transcribes some RNA and translates into protein. So that is the protein we would like to study, but that's not what we observe. In practice, we river, we engineer the DNA and then we reintroduce it into the cell. So these engineered DNA will then transcribe a reported protein that hopefully is similar to the original, sorry, um, a reporter mRNA that hopefully is similar to the original mRNA. This will then translate into reported protein that hopefully is similar to the original protein. And then when you stimulate that with a light intensity, you get the images that you've seen before. So this is actually what we have, this light intensity there. But again, the assumption is that this process on the right behaves very similarly to the process on the left. Now, the other issue is that this light intensity, as I said, does not reflect the overall uh, abundance of, of, um, of proteins. And it is actually, at most, proportional to it. So we have a proportionality constant kappa. But additionally, you also have a random error, so a random noise on top of that. So we assume that there is a stochastic noise in the measurement process. Now, the fact that this error is stochastic complicates a lot our inference because this introduces, again, latent states, latent variables for the original population of mRNA molecules. So you can think of the original process X here, observed every delta two minutes, uh, which is the process of the mRNA uh, molecules, of the protein molecules, sorry. But what we observe is at each time point, we get a noisy measurement of it. And that's what we observe. Then we get another independent noisy measurement and that, again, that's what we observe. Uh, so again, we try to separate these two sources of uncertainty from the biology and from the measurement, because obviously the biology one is what we're interested in and we want to study. The measurement one, we try to regress it out. We don't care about that. Uh, with, uh, we do that, again, with a latent variable approach. So again, we assume that all these Xs are latent variables, missing data, and we just sample them. We then, so this is for a particular cell, but we actually do observe multiple cells. That means that again, we have a hierarchical model where you think of, you know, Y is like the data, like the binary temp series for every cell. So we have uh, about 35 and 36 cells for two conditions. So in each, con in each one of these cells, we have a binary temp series that is associated to a parameter vector. Uh, and each cell has a distinct parameter vector. Again, same as before. So we have, there is flexibility in the model, but there is a common prior there. So there is sharing of information across the cells. Um, yeah, I was thinking what I'm supposed to finish at three, right? Yeah. So uh, that, that gives us a model to sample from. It has many parameters because you see there were about nine parameters there for every cell. So that means nine times 35 plus the hyperparameters. So there's a lot of parameters there going on. And so we don't sample again all of them together. We sample them in blocks of correlated parameters. So we try to find parameters that are correlated and we sample them together. <laughs> now, the other, again, the other key thing for me comes in here with the informative priors. So in this case, um, so in bioinformatics, we analyzed several genes. So we had information from other genes. Uh, here, instead, we have information from additional analysis that we did. So first of all, there was a study which is now quite old, uh, but still relevant because it gave us some indications about the degradation rate, which we use in our analysis. And then we did some additional uh, studies, additional exploratory analysis, and we could get an information, some information about the measurement process. And that allows us to actually uh, estimate the measurement process parameters and include that as prior information. And so here is a bit the, the final results of our inference. These are the posterior chains of the 35 
Uh, let me check. I've got 35 Basel and 36 stimulated conditions. Now, obviously, you don't understand anything with these plots because there's 71 lines for each parameter. So these are 10 images, one per parameter. Each image has 71 lines. And so we summarize that with the hyperparameters, so the group level parameters, one for the Basel and one for the stimulated condition. And there you go. You get a much more schematic view, which actually allows you to draw some conclusions. Uh, first of all, you under we understood that the, in the, the export from the um, Yes, sorry. <laughs> the export uh, from the nucleus is a lot faster, three times faster than the import from the nucleus. Um, and then, actually, God, this was pretty long time ago. Oh, right, yes. Then uh, when we stimulate cells, uh, most of the parameters don't change. Um, so, but what changes really is the the um, the rapidity of the of the of the movements. So the import and exports are both faster. So basically, the cell. I mean, I, I say that the cell becomes a bit more hysterical because it, the 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 um, the protein moves more quickly between nucleus and cytoplasm, but the synthesis and degradation are, are marginally affected only. And third key thing that we found, although I didn't show you how we we found that, but also we found that this is a noise induced oscillator, meaning that it's a system that, as you've seen in the original image at the beginning. It, it oscillates, there are movements, but that only happens in a stochastic context. In a deterministic context, this is a system that does not oscillate. Uh, so this is not to talk too much about the biology, but more to show you what kind of conclusions you, you can get from a Bayesian analysis of this kind. And lastly, I'll show you the um, final analysis, again, in systems biology where we, uh, we were trying to study um, transcription. So we were trying to study mRNA abundances. So this is still uh, fluorescent data, still so fluorescent images. Uh, but the difference mathematically, statistically, is that we actually don't have a time series here. So technically, we do have a, a process that evolves over time, but we only observe it at a time point. So just a snapshot. Uh, it, if you like, it's a bit like bioinformatics data, omics data, just a snapshot, not a time series data. And so to do that, we, we studied a little bit what was a, a good model to describe the transcription. And so we uh, we started from the very basic one. So this is a transcription, the most, probably the simplest transcription model, where a gene is believed to always be on and have a constant transcription. So the gene just transcribes at a constant rate, alpha. And then the mRNA is degraded at a constant rate beta. So a very simple model. That leads to a stationary distribution, uh, which behaves like a Poisson, meaning that if you observe the process in time, and if you get or if you get many cells, then you it's like drawing from a Poisson distribution. Now, this is clearly not a realistic model because there are there is a lot more noise than the Poisson can model. Um, and that, that's why we went into, we jumped to this second model, which is a lot more realistic. So you see the top part is the same as before, but now there is an additional part at the bottom there that basically says that the gene can be active on, but also inactive off. So the gene switches between two states, on and off. And it, again, it does it stochastically. So there are these waiting times that are modeled by these parameters, uh, K0 and K1. Now, this is, this is a lot more realistic because basically says that a gene, typically the gene, genes are mostly off, and then they transcribe a mRNA, a lot of mRNA, all in a short period of time. So these models, what are called transcriptional bursts. Again, gene mostly off, then it turns on, transcribes a lot, and then it turns off again. Uh, and this, again, you can study it, and it's a Poisson beta distribution. But the model we ended up using is this one here. Uh, which basically is the same as before, but with an additional arrow there. So we, we don't assume that the transcription is completely zero in the off state, but we assume that there can be uh, a non-zero transcription. So the gene, when it's off, it's not completely off, but it's actually working with a, with a background uh, level. Uh, and that 
you know, our hope was that this uh, marginal increase is moderate realism because you also allow the gene to transcribe while it's quiet. Uh, and that still results in a post beta distribution. So just to give you an idea, this is a, like a simulation, but it, it makes you a bit understand, I think, the, the process. So this is what you would normally have with these kind of models. The, this is the mRNA abundance, and this is time. So you would see that, you know, the, the mRNA abundance is um, kind of around this range. Then the gene turns on there for a very short time. A lot of mRNA is produced, and then again, it's degraded. Then the gene turns on, a lot of mRNA is produced, which is then degraded and so on. But then if you look at it horizontally, so we just look, basically you compute the density of this. So that's the thing. If you compute the density of this and you look at it horizontally, then you get a distribution that looks like that, which is a Poisson beta distribution. Sorry for the noise, it's mine. Um, so again, this was about the biological part, but just like for like, just like for the NRF2, we also have a, a complexity about the measurement process. Um, and so in this case, we actually had a different measurement procedure because we have you know, the original DNA transcribes mRNA, and then we introduce a fluorescent tag on the original mRNA. So we don't have a parallel process going on. We actually just put a tag on the actual mRNA. And then when you stimulate it with a laser, that gives us a measurement. But from a statistical point of view, from my point of view, it's the same thing because the key is that that measurement is random and that introduces mess because that introduces a proportionality constant that I have to estimate, but importantly, a random error. And so once again, the original, so this kind of the, this mRNA abundance is not observed without error. And so that is a latent state that's missing data uh, that we recover from our model. Now, we do recover this, we do work with this missing data in a different way though. So that maybe that's good because it gives us also a bit more space. What I've shown so far, so far I've shown one approach of dealing with missing data, which is typically called data, data augmentation approach that basically consists in sampling the missing data. I said, you know, missing data, latent variables are just parameters and you can sample them. So that is one approach, but there is also well, I assume there's many, but here I'm showing an alternative approach, which is to integrate out the latent variables. So you can literally compute an integral with respect to the latent variable and get rid of them. Now, the challenging part is to actually do that integral because that's non-trivial. Um, so without going into ma too many details, we sample from the, our model many times, and that allows us to compute an approximation of our uh, likelihood. Now, normally in the MCMC, you would use the likelihood to, you know, uh, to do your inference, to do your MCMC. As I said, the likelihood here is basically given by a very complex integral. So we estimate that integral with an unbiased estimate, and that allows us to use this unbiased estimate instead of the original estimate, instead of the original likelihood. Uh, this is called pseudo-marginal approach. Uh, and, and again, that basically consists in, conceptually, it's very simple, uh, replacing the original likelihood with an estimate of it, which has to be unbiased for the MCMC to, MC to work. And then the MCMC works just as usual. Uh, you might ask, why did you do a different thing with respect to the other methods? Why did you not sample those latent states? Because that would have led to a very, very big posterior space. Okay, so in this model, uh, for every cell, we all, for every sample, sorry, for every sample, we only have seven parameters, which is fairly small posterior space. It's only several parameters to sample. But there are 2,000 latent variables. So sampling 2,000 latent variables every seven parameters would have been very messy because it, it just gives a very, very big posterior space to explore. Um, and so we got rid of it and we basically integrated those 2000 uh, latent variables out. Uh, just maybe being a little bit more technical, uh, when I say mess, that means that the convergence is harder and also the mixing. So the chains kind of get stuck harder. You don't, you don't manage to, 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 to go everywhere in that posterior space or it's, it's harder, let's put it that way. Uh, 
So once again, we have a hierarchical model. In this case, the hierarchy is not on the cell because well, we cannot put a hierarchy on the cell because each cell, each cell gives us one observation. So we, we would like to, but we just cannot do that. So every experiment gives us about 1,000 single cell observations. Uh, and here it is, so a, a vector of 1,000 observations. And that is associated to its own parameter vector. There are four replicates, and then there is, again, a common prior. So again, it's a hierarchical model, uh, but on the replicates instead of the cells. Um, yeah, I mean, in this project, just like in the other one, we obviously I skipped that part, but we obviously test the model in simulations first, uh, just to make sure that things are running before we actually feed the model to real data. Um, but just like in all the other cases I've shown, I all, we also take advantage of informative priors uh, because we're basically trying to estimate, and I'll show you why this is really, really important conceptually. You know, here you have a density, okay? So you think about the normal density. Now, the normal is defined by two parameters, the mean and the variance. Uh, you know, normally most densities are defined by one, two, or three parameters, okay? Uh, like uh, the normal, the exponential is defined by one, negative binomial defined by two. The idea is that with two or three parameters, you can get a, a very sensible you know, uh, density. You can, you can get a very wide spectrum of densities. Now, this particular density here is defined by seven parameters, four that depend on the biology and three that depend on the measurement process. Now, that means that what you're mathematically, what, what you're trying to do is to say, OK, I have data about these densities. Let me try to infer the vector of seven parameters that gives these densities. That is very hard because there are so many vectors of seven parameters, so many possible combinations that give you pretty much identical densities. Different technically, but almost identical. So in practice, it's very, very hard to identify uh, a seven you know, dimensional vector that gives you a, a density. And so the way we deal with this is again, using informative priors because we have additional experiments. We ran additional experiment on the measurement process, and that allows us to use a very, very strong informative prior on the measurement error parameters. So that reduces the parameter space. It doesn't really reduce it, but it simplifies it a lot because two parameters are almost fixed by the prior. And so we're left with pretty much five parameters only. Still a difficult job because you have to identify five parameters from a density but a lot easier than, use, than having seven parameters. Okay, so once again, having an informative prior was absolutely essential for us to, uh, to be able to, uh, to identify those, uh, those parameters there. Okay, and then after we validated this in, in, in simulations, we, we took some real data, we studied the HIV gene, but that was actually just an example gene. We were not so interested in studying HIV in this case. Uh, we had the HIV gene under two conditions of stimulation. Um, and this is the kind of data we had. As I said, each sample was uh, a density of basically 1,000 measurements. So four under the kind of smaller level of, of uh, stimulation and four under the higher level. So this is the input data of our method. You can see that there is a difference between the, you know, the black and the red dotted line, um, because when the stimulation increases, the density shifts to the right, which means that you observe a higher light intensity. So the question was then, what parameters are changing? Okay, so this is what we tried to answer. What are the parameters that are actually affected by, that are actually leading to that? Um, and this is the result of our inference. Seven parameters. Here I'm plotting all the high hierarchical parameters because we only have four. So that, that is feasible to visualize. Um, so one thing, the first thing we, to notice is that most of the parameters don't change between the two conditions. But what changes the most are these parameters that refer to the switch rates. So the first answer um, to our you know, kind of biologies was that uh, the, the measurement process and the transcription is not re are not really affected by the stimulation. But what changes the most is the activation of the gene. So when the level of stimulation increases, the gene is more active. 
So again, it turns on and off more frequently. Okay, so it, it's more dynamical. And secondly, we also wanted to see whether, you know, adding this additional parameter was actually useful. Again, I keep a small reminder. You know, we were starting from this model and then we added this little branch there. So we allowed for transcription in the offset. So we just wanted to see whether that was actually necessary, that was useful, or if, if it didn't change anything. And the answer was, uh, it depends. Because if you look at the value of the transcription in the off state, it's a lot smaller than in the on state. Okay, So you see here, it's between 0 and 4% compared to the on state. So that tells you that when the gene is on, it's a lot more active, like 25 or more times more active than in the off state. But at the same time, the gene is mostly off. So it's only on about 10% of the times. So 90% of the times, the gene is inactive. So that means that even if the transcription rate in the off state is small, since the gene is mostly inactive, you still have a good portion of the transcription that actually comes from the off state. And that's about 10, 20%. So indeed, most transcription comes when the gene is active, but a non-negligible fraction, like 10, 20%, actually comes from the off state. Um, no, I'll skip you. We, uh, we don't have a package here, obviously, because I said it's, it's a real data analysis. If you're very interested you, and you want to read it, it's there. Um, but I'll, I'll spare you the summary. Um, and I'll conclude with the same picture as, as last time. Shame on me. I'll, I, I'll prom I promise I'll, uh, I'll change it next time. But this is, uh, this is an image of the David. So if you want to take questions, I mean, happy to take questions about both parts. <laughs>